Dirty Bird Podcast contains foul language and is not appropriate for young fledglings. Listener discretion is advised. Our intro music is brought to you by Ricky Pistone, aka Dick Piston. And our outro music is brought to you by the Sidewalk Slammers. Check them out wherever you get your music. Are you looking for a podcast today? With ornithology and humor you crave? Well, I know all these guys and it's birds they like. Hello, and welcome to Dirty Bird Podcast, a podcast that's serious about birds, but nothing else. In each episode, I try to talk about an individual bird species and tell you everything you need to know about them. Um, I usually try to record outside, which is why you are hearing all this rain right now. (laughs) I went out to um, First Landing State Park. Uh, There was kind of a break in the rain. I thought I'd be okay, but... uh, the rain's still coming down. I've actually kind of built a little fort um, out of my rain jacket and some sticks so that I can protect my laptop and my microphone, although you're going to still hear raindrops falling, <laughs> like right there. Um, the birds don't seem too perturbed at all. There's some chickadees and some tufted titmice that are just flitting around these branches. And uh, I hear some more birds calling in the background. So hopefully that means maybe the rain is about to let up. I'm recording kind of in a a cool little spot that I found in First Landing State Park. This is a park in Virginia Beach, Virginia, um, right on uh, the Narrows, which is uh, on the the Lynn Haven River. um, But um, it's got a lot of swampy area too. And I've kind of gone out in the swamp. I have this little island that I walk across a tree trunk to get to. It's a very cool spot, very secluded. Um, And I see a lot of bird life, too. I have a very cool um, listener-suggested episode today. But before I launch into the episode, um, let me just talk a little bit about Dirty Bird Daryl. Um, That's right, the bird in the Dirty Bird logo. That's, you know, our red logo with the the bird talking to the microphone, sitting in a chair. Um, His name is now Dirty Bird Daryl. That was uh, decided via Instagram post. That was a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody who participated. Um, 43 people participated in that final vote, and uh, I just want to give a quick personalized shout out to everyone who participated. So first off, big thank you to the winning team, Dirty Bird Daryl voters. Thank you to Crawling Camper Van, Ricky Pistone, Amanda Kanda, Seb, Lee Walker Smith, Jordan Hensel, Jesse RWH, Fish MK1, Miss Dio, Brandon Becker, Katie Pischke, Amy1844, Dream Roo, Mo Khan, Tabby TNT, Little Chris, Angel Olvera, Emily Hart, Rachel Bredeweg, Tanner Howard, Sherry Cannell. Grace Freemuth and Jesse Coker. DB Pooper voters, my condolences, but thank you to Sarah Ardilla, Lilia Haynes, Anna Van, Laura Ardilla, Ni nee Paz, Hung Fan, Tim Mastracci, Willa, Sparky, Cody Robinson, Emily Monday, Jake LaFlam, Sammy Janusic, Brandon Allman, Yarden Gnome, Eric Vieira, Henson, Mike Newell, Ben Kenny, and Danny Janusic. Also, Dirty Bird Daryl's official scientific name has been dubbed Turtus Maximus, putting him in the thrush genus alongside American robins. I know he looks like a cardinal, but that's just part of the mystique of this elusive new bird species. Also, one more thank you. Thank you to RM Birder for the five-star review on Apple Podcast. Um, They wrote, Great information on a variety of birds. Perfect mix of entertainment and bird facts. As a newbie birder, I am learning lots. Thanks for all your research. How do you find the time? It's very hard to find the time, and that's what leads me (laughs) out in the middle of the woods in the rain and trying to record. So thank you so much to RM Burger for that review. Y'all, please go leave reviews. Uh, They make me so happy, and they really help other people find the show.
All right, y'all. For this episode, I got another extinct bird episode. <laughs> um, I do so many episodes on extinct birds. I feel like probably more than uh, <laughs> you know. It might be tied with uh, you know existing species actually, um, but this one is about a small group of giant flightless birds of Madagascar, the elephant birds. Uh, this episode was suggested for me from YouTube um, by. Astra Pointe, um, after he watched my video for the Nomo Moa episode on YouTube and suggested that I do one on the elephant birds. Um, check out Astra Pointe's um, YouTube page and also his Deviant Art page. You can find it at S T R P I T 7108. Um, just one more time, that's at S T R P I T 7108. That'll also be in the episode description and the social media posts. Um, Astra Pointe has some great elephant bird drawings that I'm using for both the cover art of this episode and uh, eventually the YouTube video that I'll make for it too. Guys, I really thought I might be able to record out here in a light drizzle, but I think those birds were teasing me. This rain is not going to stop. It is coming down and... Uh, I'm worried about ruining my equipment. I don't care about me. I'm, I'm in here soaking wet and I'm having a great time in the woods. I'm fine. But um, microphones and laptops, they don't like as much to get wet. So um, I'm going to have to figure something else out for recording the rest of this episode. Um, I have an idea that I think y'all will like. I shall return. Welcome, Timmy, back to the show. Great to be back, John. Great to have you back. You're our semi-permanent, you know, co-host of Dirty <laughs> Bird Podcast. <laughs> Love being here, and I'm glad to join you, even if we're uh, over Zoom this time. Yeah, that's okay, though. It's it's just good to hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's very appropriate that you're helping with this episode because about elephant birds which are very similar to moa you know um the moa episode so you already are like sort of a uh, an expert over here oh yeah but yeah so so tim what what do you know about elephant birds uh not a whole lot john i'm looking forward to learning about them um as far as i know they do not have any resemblance to uh, the flying elephants, uh, the pink elephants from Dumbo, is that correct? <laughs> that was my first impression of what they might be. Isn't that when Dumbo gets, like, drunk? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was some great old-school Disney. Oh, yeah. Like, the main characters are, like, getting drunk and stuff. <laughs> Doesn't get better than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, these uh, these birds, you know, they have trunks and <laughs> ears and everything. <laughs> no, I, I actually didn't know really anything about these birds i think i'd maybe heard like elephant bird like at some point and like especially when i researched the moa i think i like saw something about them but i didn't really know know anything about them um but um they were actually an extinct order of birds uh, you know there a couple species um that once roamed um the east african island of madagascar madagascar um, yeah <laughs> and uh as their name implies, they were massive. Um, they were possibly the largest birds to ever exist. Um, the other contender with them is this Australian extinct bird species called Dromornis sturtoni. Dromornis sturtoni. Yeah. Um, I'm probably going to have to do an episode on him at some point. Yeah. Uh, yeah I love my giant extinct birds. <laughs> <laughs> Was that one flightless as well, I'm guessing? Yeah, okay. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, a little too much weight to carry around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The largest ever flying bird was that um, hoss eagle. Yeah. Uh, or no, actually, no, 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 no. Sorry, that was the largest pre flying predator. I think the largest ever was like some species of condor that's that's now extinct. Mm, okay. Um, but man, so many birds. I I need to extinct birds. I need to do episodes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you know, you know, the MOA, there was like tons of information on that. Remember, remember that episode? It like stretched on forever. Oh, yeah. It was fun though. That was a great one. Lots of fun. <laughs> yeah. But really there's not as much, um, research on these birds, on the elephant birds. Um, I do kind of think it has something to do with, you know, that they're, you know, an African species. Like I've just kind of noticed personally, like, you know, when it's a, uh, bird from a North America or Europe or you know an English speaking country Australia New Zealand like there's tons of research that you know goes into these birds but like 
if you pull up the Wikipedia article for a lot of like African or South American species, it's like two sentences, you know, mm. and like the cardinal gets like like thirty paragraphs. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe there's a little bit of bias going on there. Could be. Yeah. So these uh, these birds are um, cool historically speaking because when they were first found, um, when their fossils, uh, or actually it was, it was their eggs that were first dug up um people thought that they might be the giant rock bird of uh, arabian legends um i think the rock features in like you know uh the arabian knights tales and maybe even aladdin i don't know (laughs) um but uh you know when they found that they're like oh this is from africa it's sort of close to you know the middle east this is this is the rock bird of arabian legends um and also of course people thought that they were predatory when they were first uh digging up the uh the the eggs you know everyone's like oh yeah these these were giant oh yeah you know, meat eaters <laughs> i'm sure when you see something of that size it's uh definitely your first thought yeah you you automatically want to go to the just something with teeth yeah munching. monster <laughs> <laughs> from uh you know from what they've uh found um right now there's four different species of elephant birds um but there's been many many different categorizations over the years um at one point there were as many as 11 species recognized right now what i'm presenting is the most recent taxonomy that i found dating from february 2023 so this is like the most recent revision where they say there's four species like um it it was crazy when i was doing my research i was literally changing like I kept, I would read an article. I'm like, oh, there's six species. And then it's like, oh, wait, well, what? Four? Yeah. Uh, what, uh, three? Uh, five? <laughs> um, but this is the most recent one I could find. Um, there's probably going to be more rearrangements done. You know, people listening to this episode in the future, there probably will be a new paper out adding another, you know, species or, or whittling it down even more. Yeah. Um, but they're in the um, order um, Apiornithiformis. Um, and it's a, um, hotly debated topic, like I said. Um, but, um, anyway, here's my, uh, most recent, um, research here, um, based on that paper I found in February, 2023. I also, um, there was one from July, 2023, um, uh, that, um, also like made an argument for this, um, for, for species. Um, so the first species belongs to its own genus. Um, it's called, Muller ornis and and i'm gonna like go through these species all you know in detail and kind of just talk about the elephant bird in total but like i just want to lay out the different species to like do the groundwork and and we'll get into some some pretty cool facts about these birds too you know what they ate like you know of course how they went extinct and their interactions with humans too i think that's always a very interesting part but uh let, let me just lay the groundwork here first all right tim yeah let's uh let's get the elephants going all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first species, um, it's in its own genus. It's called Muller ornis. Um, as we'll learn in a moment, the Muller ornis elephant birds were shorter and more slender compared to the other genus, which is Apiornis. Um, Muller ornis is named after a guy, George Muller. Um, he was a Dutch German explorer. Um, George uh, Muller also has a mountain range in Borneo named after him. Um, Borneo and Indonesia are primarily the places he uh, explored. Also appears he explored Madagascar too. And there's accounts that he was like killed there by a group of natives, um, you know, that didn't uh, appreciate him poking around (laughs) their land um, in the name of British exploration. (laughs) Um, Yeah, if a guy walked in my yard, you know, with a uh, one of those old fashioned British explorer hats and is like, oh, this land is for the queen. (laughs) I'd probably, you know, throw a spear through him also. (laughs) there's like debate about that. I, I don't I couldn't really find a good like history about this guy, George Muller. I guess like the only person that cared about him was the person that named this species. Yeah. After him. <laughs> but um because like, I found another source that said that he died in Borneo or something like that. Mm. So I, I don't really know. But anyway, the, <laughs> this genus is named after him. The uh other genus, um Apiornis, um it contains three species, um and these ones are, are bigger. Um, they're all at least 2.7 meters. That's about eight and a half feet tall. Um, they're much more chunky than the Muller Ornis is. 
Uh, that genus name, Apiornis, um, comes from the Greek apus for high and ornus for bird. So it means high bird. And I guess I meant like tall bird, but I, I don't know. I just think that these elephant birds are maybe uh, smoking a little bit of that Madagascar. Yeah. <laughs> they have more in common with the uh, flying pink elephants of Dumbo than we expected <laughs> I mean, going into this. <laughs> I mean, I definitely thought those lemurs in that Madagascar movie were smoking something. Yeah. The, the way they were acting. <laughs> uh, there's uh, three species um, of these guys. There's Apiornis hildebrandi, um, Apiornis maximus, um, and... Uh, wait, what's the other one? Apiornis oh, oh, oh. trunkinormus. No, no, I got it. I got it. It's I didn't I forgot to write it because it's so it's just kind of dumb. There's so there's three species of Apiornis. There's Hildebrandi, there's Apiornis medius, and then Apiornis maximus. Mm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as you can guess, it kind of goes from small, medium, big <laughs> from yeah. that. Um, there are some like other little like subspecies arguments within there. I'm I'm not going to dive into it totally because, like I said, it's it's it's. You know, highly debatable, and and as of the most recent research, there's kind of an argument for you know just the uh, the four species, with three of those species being an Apiornis. Yeah, that Apiornis maximus is particularly a kind of hotbed. Um, that February 2023 paper that that I talked about, um, that one um, actually argued that it should be in its uh, there should be a separate genus for like the bigger you know variant of it called varambe titan mm. um so like it wanted its it wanted a third genus with another new species you know to bring like a total of like five uh you know total species and three genuses for elephant birds um but actually sorry i misspoke because that february 2023 paper they you know looked at that proposal for the varambe titan um uh you know its own genus and species and uh, they did extensive mitochondrial analysis on the eggshells and found no support for that separate varambe um, uh, species and genus um, and as we'll talk about the varambe tight end you know the argument that this bigger bird is its own you know separate one um, it actually probably represents more of a um, sexual dimorphism within the apiornis um uh, group, hmm. um, you know, sexual dimorphism is where males and females are different sizes. So, but we'll, we'll get to that, put a pin in that. Right. Um, just to kind of talk about these, uh, birds in general. So they're, they're big birds. Um, the largest one measures three meters or about nine feet tall. They had long legs, a thick, long neck and vestigial wings. So, Unlike the moa, remember Tim the moa? We talked about they didn't have wings at all. Yeah. They were literally just like two legs and a neck <laughs> with a head on. Ball of feathers. <laughs> yeah. So these guys at least had little, you know, stumpy vestigial wings that didn't really do anything. Mm-hmm. Like, um, uh, and their neck actually had twenty cervical vertebrae in it, um, which is a uh, pretty cool. Um, you know, it kind of just shows you how long it is. Like, uh, so this is comparable to long-necked birds like flamingos they have 19 cervical vertebrae um it allows them to have very long necks but very flexible necks um this is in comparison to um things like a giraffe so a giraffe you know really long neck but it only has seven cervical vertebrae the same number that we have as humans actually um so you know they have really tall necks but they're not necessarily very very flexible Mm. um so yeah, so, you know, the elephant birds, they have very long necks, they have very flexible necks, um, and on top of that uh, long, thick neck, though, is like a very relatively small head and, and mostly cone-shaped, too. The other thing about these birds is that they had large legs, too. They they never skipped leg day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> their leg bones are big and thick, and, and kind of like based on their leg bones is what gives them like the title of like the largest bird or the heaviest bird ever to exist. Um, those leg bones show powerful leg muscle attachments too. So like it wasn't just like big boned, like they were strong too. And uh, another crazy thing is they only had three toes. So most birds have four toes, you know, like you think about like when you see a, you know, a print from a, from a bird, a lot of times it'll be like the three facing forward and the one facing backwards. Right. 
And even birds that do, you know, really only run on like three um, toes or whatever, they still have like a vestigial little like toe spur um, that doesn't even touch the ground. But nope, they straight up just just three toes. Um, so probably made some pretty cool little footprints yeah. with that. Um, the ends of their toes were blunt and broad. Um, they didn't have any claws. So, like I said, you know, when these birds were first discovered, there were a lot of theories about what they ate. Um, like I said, of course, uh, the first fantastical naturalists thought that they were powerful predators. Um, but, I mean, Tim, they have no talons. They obviously don't fly. Yeah. <laughs> and then they have these little cone-shaped, unhooked uh, beaks. Like, that's that's pretty wimpy. Yeah, <laughs> like, not the most ideal predator from this description. Yeah. <laughs> Unless uh, their strategy was to just, like, flop onto the prey yeah. and, like, crush it to death. <laughs> Fall like, over on it. <laughs> the uh, the Snorlax uh, approach. <laughs> <laughs> um, because a lot of their fossils were found near coastal areas, people also theorize that they were shellfish specialists, um, you know, like eating clams and things like that. Uh, but their jaw structure just doesn't support this. Mm. Um, the debate was finally put to rest in 2006 in a study done by Clark and later another guy named Tovon Drafali. Tovon Drafal? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and he, he did his in 2014. Um, and they looked at carbon isotypes in elephant bird eggshells. Um, they found that a significant amount of carbon in the eggshells came from plant matter. Uh, not only that, but they were able to figure out what type of plant matter it was. Um, when they looked at the carbon isotypes in elephant bird eggshells, they found that 88 to 91 percent came from C3 plants, with only around 9 to 12 percent coming from C4 plants. So, what's a what's a C3 and a C4 plant? Yeah. <laughs> C3 4PO. <Yeah. laughs> hmm. Does it have to do with the levels of carbon in their leaves? Um. So. That was just a sort random of. guess based on the No, no, no. <laughs> like, yeah, th this one has carbon three carbon. So. This one has yeah. four carbon. <laughs> no. Um, so it actually refers to the way that they perform photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. um, I won't, you know, go into the nitty gritty of the biochem, but like, you know, you, you know, photos. You remember this from like, what was this? Middle school? Oh, yeah. Elementary school? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, but, um, you know, where, uh, you know, Light hits, uh, they turn carbon dioxide into sugar using an enzyme called Rubisco, um, which sounds like a toy company or a cracker company. <laughs> um, um, or a Rubik's Cube company. Yeah, I don't know. it's a combo. Um, it's edible Rubik's Cubes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Rubik's Cube made out of crackers. There we go. Uh, uh, anyway, in C3 plants, carbon dioxide, you know, is delivered to Rubisco rubisco through pores that open up um in the leaf and basically they breathe in the co2 from the air mm. um, through the pores um but those open pores let water vapor out so this is a problem if you're in a hot dry climate c4 plants have evolved a special leaf structure that wraps around that rubisco delivers its co2 while not letting water escape um, so unsurprisingly, C4 plants are your desert plants, you know, um, cacti, succulents, that kind of thing. Um, also some plants you wouldn't expect too, like corn and sugarcane are C4 plants. Hmm. Um, and, uh, there's actually, you know, when, when I was looking into, you know, what's a C4 plant, what's a C3 plant, um, there's actually a bunch of scientific projects going on right now trying to convert C3 plants to C4 plants. Um, so that like, you know, our agricultural crops can better adapt to climate change. Uh, that's that's kind of cool. Yeah. Anyway, so back to elephant birds. So, you know, they found a lot of, uh, you know, 90 percent basically C3 plants in their eggshells, which meant that, you know, the female elephant birds, when they laid the eggs, they were eating almost entirely C3 plants. So, you know, it's thought that elephant birds relied on, you know, um, leafy you know non-desert plants like you know they were eating like leaves off of trees or shrubs things like that mm. um at least you know when they were you know getting ready to lay their eggs and probably all the time yeah. it was probably like their their ecological niche because you can think like you know they had these long necks that they could reach up with and pluck leaves like they're basically the the bird giraffes of madagascar yeah 
Um, yeah, and actually, this is kind of cool because you know they're called elephant birds just based on their size, but like you know they pretty much were the elephants of Madagascar because you know you know think elephants use their trunks to reach up and and grab leaves and and reach down and grab shrubs and plant matter and like that's what these guys are doing. They were just doing it with their their really long necks and, and little tiny cones. Yeah, yeah, that's true. As far as like how they, you know, moved around, um, they also moved like pretty similar to the way elephants do. Um, you probably could outrun one of these birds if you had to, because hmm. their locomotion style was described as graviportal, um, which means a sort of slow, ponderous walk um, that's seen in, you know, big, big animals like, like elephants. Hmm. Um, the smaller and slender molar ornus um, was probably a bit more agile. Um, but, like, don't think of them similar to ostriches at all. You know, like, you you picture, like, an ostrich, like, which, as we'll talk about, is, you know, kind of related to these guys. But, um, you know, they're, like, sprinting across the savannah. Like, that's that's definitely not what, what these birds were doing. Like, maybe, maybe the smaller ones could hustle a little bit. But, no, they were mostly just, like, boom, pondering around. Yeah munching on leaves you know having a having a good time just lumbering hauling those leg muscles around <laughs> yeah hauling those big ass legs <laughs> bro want to do some squats <laughs> let's deadlift some leaves yeah. some c3 leaves <laughs> um so, uh, you know, as far as where they were on Madagascar, um, their fossils have been found in five specific areas. Um, all of these usually tend to be marshy environments where they turn up. Um, it's probably more related to those peat bog conditions um, helping to preserve the bones rather than the marshes being elephant birds preferred habitat. Although some have theorized and I'll talk about that, you know, that they may have, you know, relied on, on uh, kind of. Um, a lot of water source being near fresh water source being nearby. There's also a cool um, thing with them. Um, when you look at the growth plates on their bones, it suggests that unlike most birds, like think about, you know, your, your Robin, you know, it, it lays its eggs, you know, boom, within two weeks, those eggs have hatched boom within two weeks, like they're flying out of the nest and, you know, then they develop pretty quickly and, you know, come, come fall, they're ready to, you know, go fly to, to migrate or do whatever they need to do. Right. Elephant birds were not were not like that. Um, they instead had much longer and sporadic growth cycles. Their bones show signs that they would grow for a bit and then stop and then start growing again and then stop. Uh, this is actually similar to other island species like kiwis and the now extinct moa and also dodo too. Hmm. It's also seen in some uh, mammalian species too, especially like island um, species. Um, basically, what's going on here is when selective pressures um, from the mainland, like predators and competition, are removed, um, animals are able to have a more flexible growth cycle. Like, the, you know, the reason why songbirds, you know, you know, in our neck of the woods have to evolve to to fly, to grow and fly so fast is because if they don't, you know, winter's going to hit um, and, uh, you know, or a uh, predator is going to lumber along and eat their young. Mm -hmm. um, if you're out on an island and, you know, it's always a, a nice little, you know, a, a subtropical climate and there's no predators coming for you. You're like, ah, oh, you know, I'll do my growing when the, when the you know, going's good. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll invest that energy into growing when I have a surplus of food. Um, but then, you know, say like a, a drought comes along, you know, they'll, uh, they'll be like, ah, no, nah, I'm not growing this year. You know, I'm, I'm going to stay the same size. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to go buy new clothes to fit these massive legs. Right. Uh, <laughs> don't want to go, go up a waist size. Yeah. <laughs> um, and when you think of it, this is, uh, elephant birds basically have growth rings similar to tree rings in their, in their bones. Mm. Um, and it can show you know, cycles of, uh, seasonal growth cycles of, you know, good summers. Um, and you know, they would tend to grow during the summer when there were lots of leaves. And then during the, the winter, they wouldn't really grow much. And, or you could see times when there was drought and then they weren't growing, uh, you know, then, or it's like a really wet year and they would grow a lot. So it's, it's kind of cool that their bones can also serve the same way tree rings do as like a, a time capsule to, uh, for the climate. Yeah, that is really cool. And another note on their bird bones, um, some specimens, um, uh, they have found uh, their skulls having divots in them in the upper front of the skull, um, as if they served for attachment points for something. So 
Uh, Tim, what do you think might might attach on their uh, on their skull? Maybe a trunk. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that would be the wildest thing ever. It's got like a beak and a trunk. Yeah. Just like, what the... <laughs> what nightmare fuel is this? <laughs> um, so, no, I'm, I'm thinking more like a cockatoo or, or chicken. Um, it, it's thought that those attachment points may have been for either like head feathers mm. Um, or for like a fleshy organ, you know, that didn't fossilize something like, a, you know, the comb of a chicken, you know, that oh, has yeah. on its head. So, okay. yeah, they could have looked pretty wild. Like they could have had some pretty wild like head display, yeah. you know, things going on that we just we just don't don't have preserved and don't know about. Um, that also brings me to their feathers. Like we didn't really, we don't really know what those look like either. None of, none of those are preserved. It's, it's not like the Moa. Remember with the Moa, they found that frozen Moa leg yeah, going up in yeah. the mountains. That's so cool. Yeah, um, and, yeah. And so we kind of know what Moa looked like from that. Um, but we, we don't have that with these guys. Mm. Um, but, um, most ratites, which, um, as we'll talk about elephant birds are in the ratite family. Um, most ratites have pretty bland feathers, dull brown or a gray color. And then their feathers also like, uh, almost look like hair. Um, you know, like they, they're not those like flush, smooth feathers, mm-hmm. you know, we see on flying birds. Uh, they're, they're a little like stringy almost. Mm-hmm. So, um, it could have had like kind of the shaggy, shaggy, uh, feathers like that. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about each species individually. So our first species is that one that has its own genus, Molar Ornus agilis. So remember, these are like the small, slender guys. You could call them the teacup elephant birds. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) They um, probably weigh just about 90 kilos or 200 pounds. Like, come on, that's that's nothing. Yeah, (laughs) little guy. (laughs) Um. They also had much more fragile facial bones compared to the um, Apiornis species. Uh, this suggests that they did not do any pecking um, at all, like with their feeding or, you know, in interspecies like stuff. So like, even though, you know, I say this guy's, you know, on the small size, he he's only 200 pounds, like he's still the size of an ostrich. Yeah. Like it's, it's still a big bird, um, but its pelvis is really narrow. Like even compared to ostriches, its pelvis is super narrow. Um, So it must have laid, like, comparatively pretty small eggs, um, smaller than that of of ostriches. Um, One major difference between the Molarornis and the Apiornis is that while Molarornis had um, three toes also, you know, remember how they they all have just three toes, Mm -hmm. Uh, the Molarornis's toes are actually a little longer and sharper. Um, They're not like those blunt ones. So Mm. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe it did kind of have little little talons. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, so now let's go into our uh, three Apiornis um, species. So our first one is Apiornis um, hildebrandt. Um, it's also known as Apiornis gracilis. Uh, it's the smallest of the Apiornis genus, uh, but had a larger head proportionally compared to the other two Apiornis species, and it also had a proportionally short beak. So. The smallest Apiornis, but with the biggest head, but with the shortest beak. <laughs> <laughs> Great combo. <laughs> it's uh, still pretty big when you compare it to Mullerornis. Uh, it probably weighed about 300 kilos or 650 pounds. So the reason why I said uh, Hildebrandt slash Gracilis with it is because Gracilis is kind of like a subspecies of it, but it's only known from one femur specimen. Hmm. So like, I don't know how much you can conjecture based off of one femur. And that's kind of the problem with these birds is like, it's very fragmentary evidence, you know? And so someone will find one leg bone and they're like, well, it looks like this one, but it's a little bit bigger. So let's make our own genus. (laughs) I think people are just trying to like make their name by, you know, putting out papers like I discovered a new animal, you know? It may have been um, a highland specialist, this um, uh, Hildebrandt um, species, Mm. because almost all its fossils come from above 1,500 meters. So that could have been its little niche. Like it, remember that Moa, I forget, the upland Moa, I think. Remember that one lived up in the mountains, is like walking around in the snow and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like this could have been that one. um, I don't think there's snow capped mountains in Madagascar, but like it probably, you know, lived up in the higher up in the mountains and that's how it, you know, speciated. Hmm. 
So um, our next one, I really don't have much to say about. It's Apiornis Medius. Um, <laughs> the big takeaway here is it's bigger than Hildebrandt, but smaller than Maximus. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's all I got to say. <laughs> so now let's talk about the big boy, the big baddie elephant bird. Oh, yeah. Apiornis Maximus. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Um, estimates on how much it weighed range all over uh, because we don't know how much meat and feathers this guy was packing to mm-hmm. um, he could have weighed anywhere from 300 to 700 kilos that's about 650 um, up to 1500 pounds is the uh, the top estimate so that's, that's a big bird that's a big bird so to go back to earlier remember i talked about that um varambe titan um that some papers had made an argument as its own genus Mm -hmm. and uh you know that one from february 2023 was like nope we tested eggshells you're wrong (laughs) um so part of it is because apiornis maximus has skeletal remains that are um, morphologically similar but differ a lot in its total body size um so like you know they kind of like fall into two camps almost about this like one cluster of them you know is on the smaller end of the spectrum and one cluster is on the bigger end of the spectrum Mm. um but we can make sense of this by looking at a close relative very close relative as we'll see um the kiwi the kiwi has pretty pronounced sexual dimorphism the female can be almost twice the size of the male wow um, so it's it's probably what's happening here is Apiornis maximus also had pretty significant sexual dimorphism, with the females being much larger than the males, like mm-hmm. a, you know almost almost twice the size, which is which is nuts. But also is what we saw with the the moa too. Remember, yeah. like yeah, with the moa, like the um, uh, males would sit on the eggs and the females would you know be uh, be around fighting over the males and the males would be like oh, oh god don't right. hurt me. <laughs> um we don't know very much about like you know their reproduction and stuff like that um like i said we have found eggs of them and um there is a apiornis intact egg that was cat scanned to create a detailed image of the embryo within while the skeleton was still unfused um and uh while the skeleton was still unfused it was extremely well developed compared to embryos of other similar birds like ostriches and rayas um, suggesting that elephant birds were more developed at time at hatching um, than modern large terrestrial birds. So, like, by the time elephant birds popped out of their eggs, they were, like, pretty well, you know, well-grown, probably ready to just, like, run alongside their parents and start, you know, eating leaves and stuff like that, whichever ones they could reach, I guess. Yeah. Um, these um, researchers also estimated the incubation time for Apiornis maximus was around 90 days. Um, compare that to ostriches, which have an incubation time of about 45 days. So, yeah, these these nests were, you know, hanging around for a long time, yeah. three months. That's, that's a hell of a long time for an egg to hatch. It is. Um, so just to kind of, you know, tell you how big these eggs are, kind of put it into perspective. These eggs had volumes up to 15 liters. Wow. <laughs> i know man like that's huge yeah. um in fact i think i think you know i know these are like probably the biggest birds ever but like i think the fact of the show is right here these are the largest known eggs ever wow even bigger than dinosaur eggs oh man <laughs> that's yeah. crazy isn't that nuts yeah. um this is most likely due to dinosaur eggs being relatively rare like there probably was a dinosaur with with, with bigger eggs. Yeah. Um, our largest ever dinosaur egg comes from Hypsilosaurus priscus, um, which was a sauropod, you know, those long neck dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. Um, and it does have a pretty big egg. It, its egg is 30 centimeters tall, which is the same height as elephant bird eggs. Mm-hmm. They're, they're 30 centimeters tall. Um, but they're skinny and narrow. They're almost like tubular like eggs. Uh, hmm. um, while elephant birds are your classic chicken egg appearance. Right. Just huge though. <laughs> That's uh that'd make one hell of an omelet. Oh like, yeah. Fifteen <laughs> liter omelet. That's wild. So um as we mentioned, you know, the MOAs, like, you know, the males were the sole incubators of the eggs because the females were so heavy they would literally crush it. 
Um, but these these massive eggs of the elephant birds are also paired with being really thick. Their eggshells are four millimeters thick. Um, like that's that I, I know four millimeters doesn't you know sound like much. Um, but like that's very very thick when you think about an eggshell. Oh yeah. I um, mean it was yeah and and like they've done you know people have physicists you know <laughs> have done the calculations and even a four millimeter thick eggshell um, would be strong enough to support the weight of a one thousand pound bird sitting on it. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and as we'll talk later on, like humans, you know, definitely ate these eggs. Uh, I just can't imagine how they cracked them open. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> how would you crack open a egg that can support 1,000 pounds of force sitting on it? Like, <laughs> Climb to the top of a tree and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just drop it on throw a rock it or something. <laughs> on <a tree. laughs> uh, definitely not cracking those eggs one-handed. No. <laughs> So just one more comment on these eggs. Um, they must have been pretty buoyant, too, um, because on the west coast of Australia in 1998, two undisputed elephant bird eggs were found. Wow. Uh, at first, people went a little crazy, thinking that maybe elephant birds inhabited Australia, too. But the most likely scenario, although this also seems pretty unlikely, is that um, an elephant bird nest washed into the ocean and the eggs were carried to the coast of Australia by ocean currents. Yeah. Um, that's a trip of thousands of miles. Um, I can't imagine two eggs like making it when there's like you know hungry seagulls yeah. and everything in the ocean that eats stuff. But I don't. Maybe a, a seagull tried and just couldn't like peck through the shell. <laughs> yeah, like, what the, probably. So. What the hell? This <laughs> won't break. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure they got plelly of interest from the, <laughs> yeah you know, pelagic birds and the. You know, marine creatures passing underneath too, but I guess I, yeah, nothing, I know nothing could. Uh, <laughs> yeah, who could knows? Really maybe a shark it. ate it, but then just like shit it out, yeah. and <laughs> even digest it. <laughs> um, so um, while I'm talking eggs, let me tr try to talk about what we do know about the breeding of these birds in general. Um, most egg specimens appear to be from the Maximus species. Um, or at least are assigned to the Maximus species. Again, you know, we, we don't really know a lot about these guys. And a lot of these are eggshell fragments, too, you know, not, mm -hmm. not the whole egg. So, I mean, we're, we're gleaning from, you know, crumbs here about what the whole loaf looked like. Right. Um, elephant bird eggshell fragments appear concentrated around the southern and southwestern coastal areas of Madagascar. These may represent specific egg-laying sites that elephant birds would use over and over again, possibly communally, um, but we, we really don't have enough evidence to say for sure. These might just be areas where, you know, either they were brought to a bunch by humans in Eden or, like, um, although, you know, some of them date from pretty far back, like pre-human pre um, colonization, mm -hmm. um, or these could just be the only areas where they were preserved. Uh, but I kind of like the idea that, you know, the elephant birds had these certain you know, laying grounds that they would journey to, you know, during uh, certain parts of the year and uh, lay their eggs and then chill there all together, have a big party for three months. Yeah. <laughs> um, we do have evidence for, you know, what food and water they were drinking during the breeding season. Uh, remember that study, uh, that um, isotype testing guy, Clark, um, that found that elephant birds, you know, mostly were eating those C3 plants. Um, he also is able to figure out like what water they were drinking too, um, and uh, you know because some animals they get all their water from what they eat, mm -hmm. but um, he found that they were drinking a lot of water too. Mm -hmm. um, they were drinking a lot from groundwater fed ponds um, during the breeding season, um, and so this also comes back to like why marshes may have been important for them they may have like needed that water source to uh to you know really to go back to it and to to drink a lot um because it seems like they weren't getting all the water they needed from their food another interesting thing is where they placed their nests um alongside the shell fragments are um uh, you know the fossilized shell fragments a lot of times there's remnants of c4 plants hmm. um, those desert plants like succulents yeah but remember, the eggshells show that elephant birds were eating almost entirely C3 leafy plants during the breeding season. So although they nested in areas dominated by C3 succulents, they would either go travel to places with more leafy plants to eat away from their nest site, which seems kind of, I don't know, like 
counterintuitive, like dangerous one, like, you know, leaving your nest in two, like, why are you walking away from it? Yeah. Um, or like they were just really good at picking out the C four plants that were amongst the C three plants. Um, or maybe they changed their feeding behavior while they were nesting and they ate C three plants more. And we just don't see it because, you know, by that time they had already laid their eggs. Um, we, we really don't know. Um, and it, and it does seem a little weird, but I mean, there must have, must have been a reason for it. Yeah, I guess so. All right. So now let's talk about the evolution of elephant birds. Um, and then I'm going to end talking about how they went extinct. And of course, you know, the human arrival to Madagascar and, uh, <laughs> you know, how humans, uh, may likely played a role in their extinction. Uh, so to talk about the evolution of elephant birds, um, we have to go way back I'm talking like way, way back to when um, birds first divided into two camps, um, the Paleognathi and the Neonathi. Um, Neonathi contains almost every single bird, over 9,000 bird species. Uh, Paleognathi group uh, is much smaller and contains flightless birds like the ratites and a group of flying birds called the tinamous. That Paleognathi, it literally means like primitive beak. Um, it's for what they're known for. Their, their beaks kind of look a bit more reptile-like, um, so, you know, that's why paleo -nathy. Um The division of these two birds dates back to the Cretaceous period, when dinosaurs are still roaming the Earth. And um, most early fossils from the paleo -nathy group come from Laurasia, um, so it's thought that they first evolved uh, there and then colonized the southern, con uh, southern continent of Gondwana um, with flying ancestors. Um, Laurasia and Gondwana are what Pangaea broke up into, mm -hmm. and then those later became, uh, you know, the, the continents we know today. The island of Madagascar was originally part of that southern Gondwana continent. Um, then it broke up into Africa, Antarctica, and Australia. Uh, Madagascar and India were actually combined for a while, but around 80 million years ago, they separated. India would eventually collide with the Asian landmass, while the, you know, rest of like Madagascar, Gondwana and stuff moved south. Um, it actually went really far south. Uh, Madagascar went somewhere around the 30th parallel, which would have made its climate colder and more arid. Hmm. It's thought that during this time, only drought-resistant desert flora and fauna would have survived. But eventually it drifted north again to its present location. But it didn't reach it until around 35 million years ago. And it was around this point that Madagascar fully entered a subtropical climate zone that it uh, has today. Just the southern tip of modern Madagascar has that more arid uh, climate conditions, which is likely the last remnant of the ancient arid climate of the entire rest of the island. Interestingly, also during this time period, there was a strong current that drifted eastward from Africa to Madagascar, which is the exact opposite of the prevailing currents today. And most of the ancestors of, you know, uh, the species that are present on Madagascar today are thought to have used these currents uh, to inadvertently float over to the island on vegetation rafts um, created when floods wash animals and plants out to sea together. And, like, the animals are just standing on, like, all the trees and, you know, brush that wash out to sea, like, uh, yeah. I really hope I find an <laughs> island. <laughs> Going for a ride, I guess. <laughs> The paleo environment of Madagascar um, was likely one with more forests than today, um, but probably not as much as people previously thought. Um, I'll circle back to that in a second. Um, the coastal forests were likely very important um, for elephant birds when they first evolved um, to uh, live within these open forests, browsing on, on tree leaves and also venturing into areas of undergrowth um, to, to feed on shrubs. Um, and, you know, these coastal areas, too, are usually close to groundwater-fed ponds and marshes where birds can come to drink. They also keep the environment nice and humid, um, you know, supporting those, those C3 plants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, when you look at, you know, elephant bird um, fossils, you know, I mentioned they're usually found in marshes. They're usually found alongside semi-aquatic species such as pygmy hippopotamus, um, crocodiles, and turtles. But anyway, so that's how Madagascar evolved, I guess. Let's let's talk about how actually our, you know, elephant birds evolved. Um, 
I'm not going to go like super into depth about how ratites evolved. I do talk about that in the Nomo Moa episode. And, and Tim, I don't want to uh, bore your ears off with uh, <laughs> more bird evolution. <laughs> um, but, you know, the TLDR of it is it's pretty crazy because, um, you know, you look at the ratite family, you know, ostriches, rheas, kiwis, moa, elephant birds. They have all these birds that developed are flightless and then also in in a lot of cases too giganticism you know like they're huge birds yeah. you know, cassowaries um and uh so you know your gut instinct would be oh like you know they there was some big flightless ancestor and then like all the other you know big flightless ones evolved from it but like no that's 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 not what happened it's just that um you know, the, the ratite family for some reason has a predisposition. If it's in the right conditions, it's like, boom, let's lose flight. Fuck flight. Like we don't need it. <laughs> and then like, you know, if, if there's a, you know, not a, a bunch of big grazers around or something, they're like, Oh, Hey, I, I'll fill that niche. Let me get big. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm um, kind of to go back to that bigger picture, you know, when when the extinction of the dinosaurs happened, there were a lot of niches left unfulfilled. Um, the Paleonathi birds had, you know, a similar explosion to a lot of other birds um, that just, you know, diversified, colonized new areas, filled new niches that those damn dinosaurs left behind. <laughs> um, uh, there's a lot of debate about the exact, you know, relationship within the uh, the Paleonathi family um, uh, or order, I guess. What's what's pretty certain is that ostriches split off pretty early. They kind of have their own clade. Um, there's a lot of debate about, you know, how emus, rheas, tinamous, kiwis, like, uh, you know, their exact uh, relations in different clades. Um, it seems that the tinamous and the moas are grouped pretty close together. We, we talked about that in our, our Nomo Moa episode. Um, emus, cassowaries, elephant birds, and kiwis are kind of all grouped together. They seem to, to, to be pretty closely related. Um, specifically, that emu, cassowary, elephant bird group has Gondwana origins. You know, remember, like I said, you know, started in Eurasia or Laurasia, the, the Paleonathi family, then mm -hmm. colonized Gondwana. Specifically, these, these guys seem to kind of evolve around South America, you know, modern day South America. It was probably you know, like combined with, with other stuff at that time, not right. even, uh, you know, still combined with Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, it's kind of debatable about, um, you know, what exact like flying ancestor, you know, made it from there to colonize different areas. Um, there, there is this like group of extinct birds called the litho, lith ornithid, lots of eyes in that yeah. lith ornithids. Uh, they, um, they're like pretty strong flyers when you look at their bones. Um, and it's thought that they could have been the ancient Paleonathi ancestor that was like flying around colonizing different areas, um, and might be the ancestral line of the elephant birds versus the, the tinamous, which is a flying, you know, rat, uh, a flying bird related to the rat tights today, but is like basically a quail, like it can't fly very far. Mm. So, um, anyway, um, to go into how exactly these ancestors made it over to Madagascar, I kind of had to bring up, you know, I guess the second best, best fact of this show, which is the closest living relative to the elephant bird is the New Zealand kiwi. <laughs> That's which crazy. Is nuts. Yeah. yeah. Cause it's such a little, like little small, like odd bird. Yeah. And it's related to like its closest, Relative is like the biggest bird to ever live. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was crazy when I, I was looking for an image of one and one of the um, like young elephant birds came up or a depiction and I thought that looks pretty similar to a, a kiwi. That's, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, I think some of the artist depictions, they've kind of like made them look similar to kiwi. Yeah, like that makes that sense. That same body type or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, so th this is kind of cool because, you know, the kiwi is, is so small, but like you think about, I guess its ancestor had the potential to be as big as an elephant bird. Hmm. But by the time it showed up to New Zealand, like the moa were already there. Yeah. And so it's like, well, if, uh, you know, I can't join them, then I'm going to beat them and <laughs> I'll become a little tiny guy that only comes out at night and eats worms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
But yeah, I just crack up imagining like a 14 foot tall, you know, kiwi like, <laughs> walking around. Another thing that, um, you know, kind of hints at this relationship, if you look at the optic lobes of elephant birds, like when they reconstruct elephant bird brains using CTs of their skulls, um, elephant birds had really small opt- optic lobes. Hmm. Um, you know, optic lobe, that's like what the part that, um, you know, interprets uh, what your eyes see. Hmm. So this means that elephant birds had really bad vision and were likely nocturnal or crepuscular, uh, meaning like a dawn dusk um, specialist. Um, and, and, you know, Kiwis, they, they, they're nocturnal. They only come out at night. So it's like pretty crazy. So their common ancestor must have been, you know, a kind of nocturnal or crepuscular, um, um, you know, species. And then when it colonized these islands, it brought that with it and, and, you know, what it evolved it to, um, kept that, um, that evolutionary strategy. Hmm. Um, and what's what's nuts too is the bigger and bigger the elephant birds get, like Apiornis maximus, the smaller and smaller those optic lobes get proportionally. Huh. So the biggest one, Apiornis maximus, was probably blind as a bat, <laughs> like like it was probably just bumbling all around, yeah. like, running into where the everything. where are the leaves, at? <laughs> give me the leaves. <laughs> This brings me to another um, uh, kiwi uh, elephant bird thing. Um, there was a pretty recent study I read from May 2023 by uh, Naoko Takazaki out of Japan um, suggested that the common ancestors of kiwis and elephant birds likely involved in Antarctica. Wow. I always, yeah, yeah. I always think this is nuts. Like, you know, we just picture Antarctica being like frozen, dead, devoid of life, you yeah. know, except for some penguins. <laughs> but um, 35 million years ago, it was full of life. Hmm. Um, you know, that was before it moved to its present location. Yeah. Um, and uh, the ancestor to the um, that rat type clade that, uh, you know, uh, includes kiwi, elephant birds, cassowaries, like I said, they, they probably evolved around South America. And then, so then this nocturnal flying granddad of them moved to Antarctica. And then it you know, moved to Madagascar, moved to New Zealand. Like, man, these these guys can travel. Yeah. This suspected divergence um, happened around 50 million years ago. Um, so um, this is around when the, the ancestor to the elephant birds likely arrived in Madagascar and then began to lose its ability to fly and evolved island giganticism. Um, this doesn't exactly align up with, you know, Remember, I think I said it was around like 30 million years ago that Madagascar finally arrived and it's like pretty modern day position. So, mm-hmm. you know, when this ancestor was showing up, Madagascar was probably a little bit drier and, and stuff like that. But evolving right alongside the elephant birds on Madagascar were the plants that they were eating. Um, some plants in Madagascar show widely spaced leaves, um, small leaves, springy stems that make it difficult for a large bird to browse on them mm. and likely co-evolve these adaptations as a defense mechanism against their, uh, their feeding. Um, but not all plants saw elephant birds as threats. Um, there's a whole genus of succulents on Madagascar called Uncarina. They have these large fruits with widely spaced spines. Um, you know, you know those sandburrs, Tim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're kind of like that, except much bigger, and the spines are like much more widely spaced. Mm. Um, these fruits seem pretty useless when you look at them; like they're inedible. Like you know, those widely spaced spines are not going to stick to fur the way a sandbur does to right. the spurs. So, so what's the point? Um, well, I did find a. Um, uh, paper um, that theorized that uh, they're a um, trample species um, and like basically they evolved to like kind of catch on the legs and feet mm. of elephant birds who would like knock them to the ground, kick them around, step on them and break them open, like mm. like things like that. Or they would like stick on to the, you know, those widely spaced spines were good for kind of sticking on the legs and feet of the elephant birds for them to carry around. Yeah. So, uh, so that's pretty interesting too. Yeah. And then as far as when the individual genus, you know, and, and species of the elephant birds evolved, um, analysis of DNA from eggshell suggests that the split between the Muller Ornis and the Apiornis occurred around 30 million years ago, um, and while the three Apiornis species diverged in the past 3 million years ago. So remember, like 30 million years ago, it's kind of like that magic time when Madagascar first you know, showed up in, in its pretty modern day location. So um, this is when it left the arid zone, became more subtropical, and these shifts in climate probably opened up new niches that allowed for, um, you know, the Muller Ornis and Apiornis genuses to diverge. Mm. 
and and when you look at other Madagascar species like lemurs, um, a similar thing happened too around this time. The split between the three Apiornis species may have occurred due to spreading grassland in Madagascar that isolated different populations. And then another crazy evolutionary fact about these guys is uh, Apiornis maximus, you know, with that huge body size, 1,500 pounds. Mm-hmm. This likely happened only within the past million years. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. The first elephant bird called the crown species um, was likely around the size of Mullerornis, you know, like basically emu ostrich size. Mm. Um, but it seems like species of Apiornis just kept getting bigger and bigger and finally, you know, climaxed in that, you know, thousand pound Apiornis maximus. Um, it's thought that this may have been a thermoregulatory adaptation as the climate cooled during the Pleistocene. Um, you know, like if you're bigger, you lose less heat, Mm -hmm. but it may have just been island giganticism going crazy. Yeah. Uh, our oldest, uh, fossil record of, uh, you know, this is all like inferred from DNA evidence, um, you know, about like when they evolved and things like that. Our oldest fossil evidence though, comes from eggshells, which date from 22,000 BC. Hmm. So that's the story of uh, elephant bird evolution. What, what you think, Tim? The the kiwi thing still blowing your mind? Yeah, it is. That's <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Thinking about because uh, I I've never seen a kiwi in person, but I what I know about them is that they're uh, they're pretty small. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about how they went extinct, and I guess the way to lead into that is to um, talk about the human colonization of Madagascar. So to just kind of geographically, like, you know, set the stage, Madagascar, it's the fourth largest island in the world. It lies uh, about 250 miles off the coast of uh, Africa to the east. Um, Geographically and based on trade winds and ocean currents, Madagascar is actually kind of the centerfold of, you know, maritime trade in the Indian Ocean and for the civilizations of Africa, the Middle East, Asia, India, um, it's like, you know, you think about it just as like a little tag along uh, next to Africa, but it's actually kind of the center of, of a, a big highway. Hmm. Um, so when humans began to sail and, and travel the seas, they inevitably would come across Madagascar. Um, and uh, when you look at like linguistic data, genetic data, um, the first settlers of Madagascar appear to have come from Africa and Asia. Um, There was also, like, an all-male population from the Arabian Peninsula that arrived later on. Um, Our first clues on when humans came to the island is about 2000 B.C., where there's some knife marks on animal birds, including elephant bird bones. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, it's thought that these were probably just, like, um, um, uh, that these were not, you know, stationary humans like they were kind of like traveled to the island hunted you know stayed for a while and then left kind of similar to uh, you remember Kupe from uh the uh, uh moa episode like oh, he was yeah. the polynesian Kupe. he showed up he stayed mm-hmm. for like five years and then left yeah um to you know told people about him they, and then the maori people eventually you know settled it right so um the first permanent like um uh human occupation doesn't turn up uh, until about 500 bc though The Madagascar of, you know, back in prehistory was an island full of varied climates. Um, To the southwest is that dry, arid desert I talked about, the last remnant of, you know, the the ancient uh, Madagascar. Um, There's mountainous regions in the central and northern part of the island. Um, The eastern escarpment um, teems with rainforest. To the west, there's grassland and shrublands. And when they showed up, there were giant lemurs that could be as large as gorillas. There were <laughs> dwarf hippos that are only three feet tall. There were these cute little lemurs called babacotia that uh, behaved like sloths. So it was like a, a different island as yeah. far as the you know, <laughs> fauna. When humans did settle, they likely settled you know around the marine coasts first, you know, uh, taking advantage of all the fish and everything like that. Um, especially a lot of mangrove species were exploited. Um, they would cut down trees for firewood, go after tubers, cacti, shrubs uh, to supplement their diet. Um, so you know, they as humans do, we immediately started you know changing the environment around us. Um, but elephant birds were likely you know pretty immediately you know spotted and 
Um, if not, you, you know, as we know, 2000 BC, they were definitely being hunted. Um, so they probably very quickly became part of the, the hunting diet. And then especially their eggs, too, were likely highly sought as food sources. I mean, that 15 liter omelet, Tim. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> it's going to feed a lot of people. <laughs> um, so uh, we, you know, we see a lot of knife marks on elephant bird bones. We see a lot of crushed eggshells and human settlements so you know we know that they were eating them but there were a lot of other indirect effects too um uh the first settlers to madagascar brought with them cattle which began to compete with elephant birds for food um and uh deforestation both from you know the cattle um and then from you know slash and burn agricultural land techniques um likely removed a lot of the the tree leaves and and stuff like that that elephant birds relied on to eat we don't know exactly when they went extinct. Um, there's a possible sighting of the last remaining elephant birds from uh, the French occupation of Madagascar in the 1600s. A uh, Monsieur Intine de Flecure, mm. uh, <laughs> the French governor of Madagascar. In um, 1661, he wrote in his Histoire de la Grande Isle de Madagascar. <laughs> Um, that a species he dubbed um, Voron Patra um, lays eggs like the ostrich, and to avoid <laughs> people taking its eggs, it seeks out the most loneliest places. Mm. <laughs> Pub on a cigarette yeah. and uh, drink some wine. <laughs> uh, apologies to any French listeners. <laughs> um, it's unclear from this description if he actually saw these birds. Or if he was just describing rumors that he heard about them. Um, unfortunately, he drowned while sailing back to France um, to, you know, give his full account. So uh, we'll, we'll never really know. Um, there were um, some other um, French naturalists, um, Alfred um, Grandidier and Alphonse Milne Edwards. Um, they declared elephant birds to be extinct in 1869 when they studied the flora and fauna of the island but suggested that they had gone extinct in recent years. Hmm. Um, they didn't really give any evidence on, on that. But um, really the only concrete evidence we have on when they, you know, for sure, like this is the last date an elephant bird was on Madagascar, is a eggshell fragment from Fort Dauphin, which is a city on the southeast coast of Madagascar. Um, and it carbon dated to 1290. Hmm. Um, so, you know, like... As, as, you know, we do with a lot of extinct species, it's easy to blame the humans, you know, like, ah, humans showed up, they hunted them to extinction, they're damn cows, they're, they're damn clearing of land. Right. Um, but the thing is, when you kind of look more at the evidence, um, it kind of doesn't look like, like the humans may have been the nail in the coffin. They certainly weren't helping things. Um, and, and one of those pieces of evidence is that, Humans coexisted with elephant birds for about 2,000 years, you yeah. know? If that last one went extinct, let's say 1290, that was the last elephant bird egg. Well, the first human, you know, settlements were 500 BC. So, you know, that's that's pretty much 2,000 years yeah. that elephant birds and humans were, you know, kumbayaing. Well, not really. I mean, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they were hanging out. Yeah. Um, you know, compare that to the Moa of New Zealand. They were extinct within 200 years mm -hmm. of the Maori people uh, settling New Zealand. Um, b elephant birds were, were likely already on their way out by the time um, humans colonized Madagascar. Mm. Um, you know, like I said, Madagascar is um, um, centered around the convergence of those northern and southern trade winds. Mm -hmm. This results in a lot of variability and unpredictability in the climate. Um, sediment core analysis shows longstanding cycles of droughts in Madagascar, which likely put a lot of pressure on the elephant birds. Yeah. Uh, in general, the climate of Madagascar became much more arid and dry as the Pleistocene transitioned to the Holocene around 11,000 years ago. And uh, this resulted in a transition from C3 to C4 plants. <laughs> Remember those uh, C3 to C4 plants? They're Tim? back. <laughs> <laughs> They're back. <laughs> So when those C4, you know, cactus, succulent plants began to dominate the landscape of Madagascar, this was the removal of a huge food source for elephant birds. 
Um, Muller Ornis seemed to have a little bit different of a diet. Um, it snacked on more C4 plants than the uh, um, Apiornis species did. Remember, I said the Apiornis, they do 90% um, C3. Hmm. Um, but um, Muller Ornis appears to have been able to do about 30% C4 in its diet. So it's a pretty good chunk. Uh, you know, it could tolerate like up to a third of C4. So yeah. probably it tolerated the climate change a little bit better. Um, another thing, though, is, you know, when the uh, climate became more arid, a lot of those groundwater fed ponds and marshes dried up. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, we talked about how uh, those were pretty important for the elephant birds, too. Right. When you look at other um, species of Madagascar, like the dwarf hippopotamus, that gorilla-sized lemur I was talking about, those also seem to coexist around humans for like 2,000 years before suddenly dying off around the same time as the elephant birds. Hmm. So, I mean, that that kind of suggests that there was a, a big stressor going on um, on the island that killed off a lot of things. Right. And, and humans were suffering also. Um, when you look at this time period at archaeological sites, um, they found that starvation foods at settlements um, went up um, during a lot of drought conditions and, and during this time. Huh. Yeah. So what do you think a starvation food is, Tim? Hmm. Probably a pretty broad category, I would guess, <laughs> for... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's like stuff stuff you wouldn't normally eat. Yeah, so so the one that uh, they find a lot in the archaeological record, um, probably because it's pretty well um, uh, preserved, is a tiny aquatic snail called Narita undata. Um, it's only four centimeters long. <laughs> so, I mean, it probably takes a lot of work collecting it, prying off its shell. For yeah. Not much payoff of a four right. centimeter little <laughs> snail. Not a lot um, of calories so, per snail. <laughs> yeah. So, basically, it's a starvation food because you wouldn't be collecting and eating these unless you were really hungry. Right. Makes sense. Um, and that whole thing that like, oh, Madagascar used to have all these trees that the elephant birds, you know, uh, relied upon and then humans came and cut them all down and starved the elephant birds like that doesn't really you know hold up either when you look at um uh, a lot of like um uh, core samples done in in madagascar we see that like fire was always part of the uh the um you know climate there and mm. that uh grasslands also were probably you know much more involved into it it wasn't like all covered in you know virgin forest um so really the humans probably didn't shake up the environment as much as you know it was it's been you know uh like hyped up to be in the past yeah yeah so unfortunately elephant birds probably were just inevitably going to die out um it's it's unfortunate i'm jealous of those couple humans that were able to you know see them and stuff yeah and that would have been quite the sight <laughs> <laughs> um so just a couple um closing remarks here tim um one is a cool fact i came across um do you do you know the author hg wells yeah yeah yeah, so, you know, he's the guy that wrote War of the Worlds, The Time Machine, The Invisible Man. Mm -hmm. um, he also wrote a short story called Apiornis Island that oh, centers wow. around elephant birds. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it's worth a read. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't read it. I, I, like, read some quotes from it. And I actually found this pretty pretty cool quote from it that, like, kind of summarizes um, – uh, my frustration when I was researching these Apiornis species. Hmm. Um, so um, when they found an Apiornis with a thigh a yard long, they thought they had reached the top of the scale and called him Apiornis Maximus. <laughs> then someone turned another thigh bone, four feet six or more, and they called it Apiornis Titan. <laughs> if they get any more Apiornises, he reckons some scientific swell will go and bu burst a blood vessel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's how I felt reading. It's like Varambe Titan, Apiornis Maximus. Yeah. Apiornis Maximus Maximus. <laughs> Wait, there's a bigger one. <laughs> Apiornis Gigantacus. <laughs> I'm the biggest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like these scientists really are just like having a freaking size contest. Yeah. <laughs> My bird's bigger. <laughs> um but yeah that story is uh is kind of crazy like um uh, uh spoiler alert it's basically about a guy who finds an elephant bird 
uh, egg buried in the mud. And, uh, you know, eventually in the course of the story, it hatches, grows into, you know, a 14 foot tall terror bird that starts attacking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess making them predatory is probably a little better for. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. A for fictional selling story. <laughs> yeah. Instead of he's like munching on leaves. Yeah. He just peacefully <laughs> stomps around. <laughs> just a peaceful little bird. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Tim. Well, any uh, any closing remarks on elephant birds? They were really cool to learn about. I really enjoyed the episode. And uh, we've got the Moes of New Zealand now and the elephant birds of Madagascar. We're going to have to find another uh, giant flightless extinct bird from another island, I guess. Well, we have that <laughs> um, Dromornis stertoni oh, right. from Aus- Australia, Mike. Yeah. Dromona <laughs> Yeah, so maybe maybe that one's next. That's our next extinct species. Yeah, and, uh, and you'll have to sit in on that episode too. Yeah, we can do accents for the duration of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I think we'll get our first hate mail. Yeah. <laughs> we just do the whole thing in terrible Australian <laughs> accents. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be a hoot. A hoot. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me again, John. It was a great time. Great episode. And uh, keep on leaving reviews. Dirty birdies. It's been awesome to, to see John keep cranking these out. I know he enjoys it. And it's been awesome to see the, the fan base grow and uh, have more people get into learning about birds. Yeah, I want our fan base to keep growing like Apiornis Maximus on, uh, on Madagascar. Just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger oh, until yeah. scientists burst a blood vessel. <laughs> <laughs> well, as always, stay dirty, fellow birdies. Dirty Bird Podcast is brought to you by me, John, with my rotating panel of guests and co hosts. Thanks for being on the show, everybody. The Dirty Bird theme song is by Ricky Pistone. Check out his groovy and hilarious music videos on YouTube. The outro music you're listening to right now is a song New York Redneck by the Sidewalk Slammers. Check them out wherever you get your music. The Dirty Bird Podcast logo is by the very talented TJ Ranoski. And of course, a shout out to my beautiful wife, Lauren, who created my original logo. Check out the show notes for this episode for a full list of credits for any bird calls or sounds used in the episode. Thanks for listening. Track drive into Brooklyn ain't never coming back. Tim's on the ground in the concrete jungle. I might get into a little.